A few people have asked me what this Spam One thing that I've been working on is all about. And it's been a bit of a journey, and so hopefully some of what I've got to say about it's interesting and helps explain that question. I thought rather than explain it many times, I'd explain it once and then create this video. So here goes. Okay, the title says Spam One 8-bit TTL CPU, and I'll explain um, a bit about what that means. But I'm actually building the entire computer from the ground up. And what do I mean from the ground up? Well, I mean starting with defining an instruction set for the CPU. The instruction set defines the capabilities of the CPU. And this meant taking a look at some old classics like the 6502 CPU and more recent ones like the ARM. I needed to design and implement a set of hardware to execute the instruction set. And this portion of the hardware is what we, I think we generally mean is this mean by the CPU. And the rest of the computer, including the memory and any input and output devices, are all peripheral to the CPU. So you can really see this is from the ground up. Now, um, it'll become apparent that what I really, what really appealed to me about this project is the fact that it's built mostly from vintage technology. Most of the um, vintage tech here is um, using this project is older than I am, but I'll come back to that. Um, but before I get ahead of myself, I'll give a quick summary of what I'm going to be geeking on about for the next um, 30 or 40 minutes. And then you can decide if you're going to um, just turn the video off or not. So um, there's a little photo of Spam1 there um, during development. I've mentioned it's vintage um, tech and I'll explain a bit more about that. But during this talk, I'll give you an inkling into the motivations of this particular geek. Um, what this thing called Spam1 is all about. Why on earth would I build it? how I went about building it, architecture, design, verification, software stack, some notes about what I learned and the future. Quick warning, there are some flashing images in this presentation. Okay, so an alternative name for this project would be Spam1 Homebrew 8-bit TTL computer, not CPU. And that's because I'm building the whole computer, not just the CPU. But there are no microprocessors here. Everything is macro, very much macro, no micro or macro. Um, now, I'm going to break that down, that title down a little bit more and explain what it all means. So um, the term um, homebrew definitely applies here. This project's built at home. Um, homebrew CPU has a particular meaning in the retro computer community, but it's basically something built at home. Um, 8-bit, that's definitely something that's been around for a long time. 8-bit means that the, the um, CPU handles maths um, or data values 8 bits at a time. And the amazing 8-bit BBC Micro and the Spectrum and the crazy simple ZX80, they were all 8-bit. Um, they were from the time of my youth. And I'm, some, I'm sure some folk um, will know that the firm behind the BBC Micro also architected the ARM CPU that eventually took over the modern world of devices. Um, I think Wikipedia claims that Acorn, who invented the ARM, used the BBC Micro to simulate the original ARM chips during development. And simulation is a really good thing to do if you're architecting a new CPU, and I'll come back to that. Um, I said 8-bit is retro-ish, and 8-bit, but is 8-bit really retro? An unreliable glance at the retailer mouser shows that there's a ton more options for 8-bit microcontrollers than 16 or 32. Um, even the venerable 6502 is still being included in new devices. I could be wrong, but I believe one argument is that because the 6502 is so stupidly simple, and like I said, I think it's only got three or 4,000 transistors, and because it's been around so long, it's considered bomb-proof. I heard something about medical devices, but I could be wrong. Um, so TTL, yeah, it's a T uh, we're calling it a TTL CPU. That's definitely retro. So retro, in fact, that it's obsolete. And TTL means transistor-to-transistor um, -transistor logic, and TTL is a technology that goes back um, to just before I was born, so that is definitely retro. But TTL used a ton of power, and so it was phased out um, for a new tech called CMOS. And there you have um, the newer CMOS gate on the left and the old TTL gate on the right, and you can see clearly that the CMOS one on the left uses a lot less power, uh, power and has better um, signal levels. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, no, I don't know, maybe. Anyway, TTL devices are controlled by current and CMOS devices are controlled by voltage and CMOS or its derivatives run the modern world, not TTL. Um, so the kind of um, chips that are in SPAM1 are these um, so-called 7400 integrated circuits shown here. 
these chips contain primitive functions um, and gates or gates and so on and various kinds of switches and these um, 7400 chips were used throughout the microcomputer revolution and they're still used today but they're definitely retro span one um, uses the CMOS variant of these 7400 chips not TTL um, but the term TTL CPU persists in the homebrew CPU community as, as a historic reference I think so forgive me if I stick with TTL computer and not CMOS computer Anyway, here's one for any old timers out there. This glorious old book was the TTL Logic Bible. Every TTL tinkerer out there had one. I had one um, containing all the technical details of tons and tons of devices. Okay, so computer, yeah, that's boring. Um, okay, I'm building a homebrew computer and not just building a homebrew CPU. But why spam one? Why oh why? Um, well, I endearingly call my son spam sometimes. It's definitely due to some kind of recessive Monty Python memory of this spam, spam, spam sketch. So in a way, I've named this project after my son, which is so sweet, isn't it? Um, you should go and watch um, some of that Mon some Monty Python videos and be the best version of yourself. So Spam 1 is made of 60 or so of these 7400 series integrated circuits, pushed into a load of breadboards, hundreds of individually cut wires, and it's all mounted on a big chunk of plywood. And there's a breadboard for you. And you can imagine me leaning over that for hours on end, shoving chips and wires into holes and getting no sunlight. And I guess that slide speaks for itself. I've got a ton of this stuff. Um, when you're building a project like this and you're not entirely sure what you're building and you keep changing your mind, well, you accumulate a bunch of stuff. So what does Spam 1 look like? Let's just take a quick look at it. There's Spam 1. It's got some blinking lights. Apologies for the jerkiness of this video. But it gives you a clue of, um, of where, where I'm currently at with it. There's obviously a few gaps there. And over there on the left-hand side of the image, there's um, a cable hanging down. That's actually... Um, a connector for a Nintendo gamepad to allow me to do some user input on some of the games. Okay, so you wouldn't do a project like this if it wasn't personal. And like all good stories, it starts with Once Upon a Time. So, Once Upon a Time, John is 14 and he's making some home digital electronics projects. He was using those 7400 integrated circuit chips. But Johnny was also doing some high voltage electronics, building strobe lights that used a transformer to bump the um, UK mains voltage up from 240 volts up to about 4,000 volts. So little Johnny clearly isn't getting enough adult supervision. Luckily, the Grim Reaper decided not to prune Johnny out of the gene pool. And so I'm here speaking to you today. Now, shortly, around, shortly after that time, a teacher at my school set up a computing club and somehow he got permission to have a teletype like that one there on the left and um, connect over an acoustic coupler like that one there on the right to, I believe it was the mainframe at the Ford Motor Company. Um, now, I've no idea how he pulled that off, but my first trivial programs were written on this kind of thing at about 14 or 15, and I think they were on the mainframe. So by now, I've got a bit of electronics under my belt and a little bit of programming all on this kind of ancient tech. And this is the era of the golden age of home computing. Things like the ZX80 and the ZX81 and other kit computers were appearing in the UK and all for less than £100. If only I'd had £100. And like the era of classic cars, this was a period where you could still lift the lid on something and figure out how it worked underneath and even make mods to it. And at this point, though, folk weren't really creating computer brands in their sheds anymore. Apple had big offices by now and almost went bust, I think, shortly after this, probably in 1981. But here comes the sob story. With my interest in electronics and software, I would have loved to have been doing what those guys did. But you needed tools and you needed education and you needed money, none of which I had. And I also had this image of the proper hardware hacker as someone with a big shiny oscilloscope. So I never got to be the hardware hacker I wanted to be, and I never got to own that oscilloscope. And without an oscilloscope, I was never going to have the feeling I was a true engineer. But family and work got the better of me, and I let it lie. So 30 or 40 years pass, and I come across some YouTube videos by a bloke called Ben Eater. And if you're interested enough to still be listening to me talking here, then you should definitely go and watch Benita's stuff on, on YouTube. Um, the videos reminded me of my early passion for digital electronics. 
But I realized that now, 50 plus, um, I was able to afford some of the kit um, that, that I couldn't when I was a child and maybe do some of the interesting projects that I, I'd have wished to have done at that time, like building my own computer from the ground up if that's what I wanted. So, Spam 1 8-bit TTL computer came to life. So that was 2019, it's now 2022. Is it finished? Is it hell? Um, but it's been driven by nostalgia for simpler times and opportunities to learn and tinker. And I finally got the excuse to go and buy that oscilloscope so I can finally call myself a real engineer if only I could finish this project. Now, I could have built the entire Spam 1 computer as a software simulation and never built any hardware. But if you're building a simulated CPU, then you're never really subject to many limitations. And so you'll um, have to make relatively few design compromises and trade-offs. And you're going to learn relatively little from the experience. Um, so building something physical forces you to constantly reconsider what you need and to optimize many times over. Um, so with hardware, you've got a ton more trade-offs to make. Um, and these are some of the concerns I had to live with. And um, these will be shared with designers of vintage and I guess current microprocessors. Obviously, I opted for a hardware build. What this meant for me was doing all the things I needed to do for the simulated software approach, but then additionally turning it all into hardware. And with that hardware comes um, technical risks that a software solution isn't really subject to. And um, the problem of glitches in particular, um, occur. I'll come back to that. So next I had to decide what I was going to build in terms of an ISA, an instruction set architecture. I wanted something that was really simple. I didn't want to have to think too hard and I was happy with what I ended up with. It was simple, um, I'll get to it in a minute, but I came across an article that described the old 6502 processor that ran many retro computers as a RISC CPU and I wondered was Span 1 and would it be considered RISC? So let's take a look at some numbers. Well, there's 250 opcodes, I think, or thereabouts in the 6502. Um, okay, so SPAM1 has a single instruction. It's a flexible instruction, but it's still just a single instruction. Each SPAM1 instruction takes two arguments and produces a result that gets written to some target device, which could be a register or RAM or something else. But every operation also emits status flags to indicate whether the result of the operation was negative or a carry or some, several other conditions. And these status flags can be used to control the con execution of any subsequent instruction. And this is all fairly standard stuff in, in, in most CPUs. But I wanted to keep the, um, the ISA simple and consistent. Now, so for instance, most CPUs have got some subset of instructions for dealing with things like the process status flags, um, for say for instance, conditionally jumping from one location to another. But in SPAM1, every instruction has the option of updating the status flags or not, and every instruction has the option of executing conditionally based on the prior state of those status flags. The example here on the, on the, uh, on the slide here is, um, only add register um, B to register C if the negative flag is set. So the instruction set's really consistent and easy to remember. Um, the instruction set was the first big design step in the process and it also defines the needs of the hardware. So this was, this was a huge decision for me. So um, I wasn't really thinking about risk when I designed SPAM 1, but I think it definitely qualifies. Right, so I've got my instruction set. Next step is to create some pretty diagrams to figure out what structure the hardware would take. So this diagram illustrates what's inside SPAM 1. Most um, computers have got a similar set of components and it's the um, individual capabilities of those components and how they're assembled that's the special source that makes a CPU what it is. So SPAM1 is similar to other CPUs but different. Um, those that did computer science presumably know what all these parts do. I didn't do computer science. There's a whole bunch of control logic whose job it is to coordinate the components of the CPU based on the instruction from the program memory and that's really the heart of the CPU. We've got memory, the ALU that does maths and logical operations, IO devices, and so on. The um, gray box here indicates the components of the SPAM1 computer that I think we'd call the CPU, and the rest are just peripherals. The green arrows indicate data paths leading into the ALU to perform a maths or logical operation. Blue paths indicate um, data coming out of the ALU back to the various devices, and the brown color indicates components that are primarily about the control logic of the CPU about making decisions. So I want to draw your attention to these two blocks of memory either side of the CPU there. Generally speaking, 
This pattern here is, is quite common for microcontrollers. It's not so common for general purpose computers like I intended SPAN1 to be. And this um, arch um, is distinctively what's so so-called Harvard architecture, as opposed to a von Neumann, um, such as the one that's sitting on the PC on your desk. Von Neumann has program and data in the same uniform memory space. A big difference um, this organization of memory makes um, as to how the program is read and executed. In short, the Harvard architecture is likely to be more efficient. However, it's also limited in other ways, such as convenience and flexibility. So here's a summary of the architecture. Um, separate program and data stores, a bunch of registers, very capable ALU for an 8-bit CPU, and a bunch of other peripheral things, which I'm not going to read right now. But of course, uh, blinky lights are a mandatory part of any um, homebrew CPU implementation, and SPAN1 is not short of those. So, I've got my shiny architecture diagram. What next? Well, I needed to figure out which chips I needed and how I was going to wire them together. So, I created a bunch of circuit diagrams, and all the schematics are online in Easy EDA links um, later. Um, there are pages in there for the RAM and the registers, the program memory, the control logic, timing circuits, and so on. But I'm not one for only drawing pretty pictures like schematics and architecture diagrams. I didn't want to spend a long time building something only to find out that there was some, some fundamental flaw or tricky glitch late in the day where I'd have to pull out a ton of, ton of wires and, and scratch my head for hours on end. So, um, so and remember, this project was all about learning. So I wanted to build an executable model or simulation or both for the hardware ideas before committing to building the hardware. And I'm aware that real silicon and real wires have propagation delays in the nanosecond region that limit the speed at which um, signals can be transmitted accurately. And unless you understand and plan for those propagation delays, then it can lead to hard to find spurious signals being generated in the circuits. And these might fool the processor into thinking it had been told to do something it hadn't. And the biggest worry is those timing, um, timing glitches that cause momentary pulses on wires that last for only a few nanoseconds. But they're enough to trigger um, other components to do things we don't want. And, you know, but software is easy to debug. But there's no convenient debugger for actual hardware. So, again, choosing to build hardware as opposed to a simulation is a really big decision. It, it, it you know, massively increases the effort. So I was scared by the prospect of glitches all over the place. Uh, I decided to build a nanosecond um, accurate model of the entire computer and then use that as a simulation to run the actual SPAN1 programs. And what this required is creating um, a hardware description model for every TTL device I was going to use and then setting the model up with some realistic propagation delays. And the software to help that, um, I'd recommend using System Verilog, System Verilog language, um, and the Icarus Verilog simulation software that's pretty great um, to simulate your hardware if you're building one of these things. Um, and then if you add a few constraints to that model, to that Verilog model, then we can detect and mitigate those glitches before um, building the hardware. Um, sadly, though, there, there are relatively few Verilog models out there for the 7400 chips with accurate propagation delays. So my GitHub repo is one of the few places you can go and find um, a lot of timing accurate 7400 devices. And I believe if some other folk are using them now as well. Um, um, over on the right, you can see one of my models for a 74157 multiplexer chip. That's a fairly simple one, but it's a mixture of logic and timings. And I had to write a load of these things. Um, and where do you get all the propagation delay information from? Well, you need to read it from the data sheets. You have to read a lot of these things. Now, when building hardware, you really want to make the use of all the tools at your disposal. And in, in this slide here, you can see I'm using part of the Icarus toolset to um, plot um, some signals going on within one of the devices. I think it's the register file. Um, and you know you can use it to diagnose glitches and whatnot. So here I can home in on the glitch and I can see that it's synchronized with two other events that are occurring, two other transitions. This is a graph of the 74670 devices I'm using. But Verilog is slow to run. So um, I wrote a fast simulator for the CPU. What we can see here is the CPU um, running a program. I think it's the Mandelbrot program as it goes. I wrote this in Kotlin, which was another opportunity to do some learning, but this isn't timing accurate and it doesn't need to be. The Verilog simulation is timing accurate. This thing just needs to be functionally correct so that I can actually test programs on it. 
the simulator shows all the registers changing and the program counter advancing and the individual instructions flying by. So the combination of the Verilog model as a proof of the um, timing of, this, of the, um, the CPU and this, this simulator to explore and test the instruction set allowed me to work out loads of gaps and niggles in the hardware and software design before I actually um, put a single chip into a breadboard. But you need an assembler to program um, your instruction set. You're not going to sit there all day poking ones and noughts into files and ROMs, are you? So um, I, I wrote this using Scala. I use Scala because it's got this brilliant feature called parser combinators. It's just great for, for building grammars and parsers. So that's a, that's a, a top tip. Don't use Lex and Yak and whatnot. Use um, something a bit more modern. Um, all of this is in my GitHub repo. Um, yeah, not, not, not happy just to have an assembler. I wrote a, um, a high level language. It's rather C-like. There's a sample of it there on the right. Um, and I, again, I used this to create a Mandelbrot, prot, a Mandelbrot plot, which seems at the moment to be um, a popular way of um, looking at this performance of your CPU. More recently, I started working on a port of an existing NCC compiler called VBCC to spam one. I did give GCC and LLVM a go, but they're way too complicated to port. So you got the design done and the verification is sorted. And my advice to anyone um, at this point is not to use a lithium power bank or other high current device, but instead to rely on AA batteries or AAA batteries until the design is known to be working. The problem with lithium sources is that, or any other high current source, is that if you wind up a chip incorrectly, then the lithium power bank will quite happily dump several amps into your circuit, melting hardware, um, melting wires, burning fingers, and so on. The interior, internal series resistance of half depleted 1.5 volt batteries that will barely run your, your, um, your project um, does save a bit of embarrassment. Okay, so I decided what all the circuits were gonna be. I um, did the layout of um, my CPU using bits of paper on a table on a holiday in Cornwall, very low tech. And this gives you an idea of the um, distribution of components across that sheet of plywood that I showed you earlier. And the, I won't go through the individual components, you can see that for yourself there. So I've got this monster pile of hardware on my table. It's been a giant time sink for a year at this stage, and it's sitting there dormant on the table. To get here, I had to do research into the instruction sets and make design decisions on the ISA and the architecture. I had to design the circuits to execute the instruction set using a pencil, paper, and simulations. I created an assembler and a compiler for the CPU before building the hardware. I ran a bunch of test programs on the simulator to debug all the wiring. I translated the simulations into schematics, built the electronics as modules, assembled the whole thing together, and all that's left is to throw the switch. Now, at this point, if the thing sitting on your table doesn't catch fire, then you're doing really well. And now you've got to decide what your first significant program is going to be. So it's gonna be something simple, right? Yeah, wrong. Um, what I decided instead to do was to build a full blown emulation of a completely different hardware architecture entirely called Chip8, and then try to run a bunch of Chip8 programs on Spam1. Now, why on earth would you do that? Well, I could have written a bunch of little trivial test programs, but um, writing an emulator using the, that, that software toolset I mentioned, the compiler and the assembler previously, would be a great test of, of to see whether or not my hardware and software skills were up to snuff. So Chip8 is also interesting beyond its definite retro status. As I say, there's a load of games. They're pretty basic um, given the simplicity of the Chip8 hardware. The games include the usual suspects that spam one there, I think, build um, running Tetris, I think. Um, yeah, they were Tetris. Um, actually, you can see that the, uh, the pieces just fall to the bottom consistently because this was filmed prior to me building the um, uh, Nintendo GamePad input device. Um, it's got the, 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 all the usual suspects are there for Chip 8, like um, um, Invaders and uh, Pac-Man and a ton of other um, games from yesteryear like Pong, all in glorious monochrome. But how does it perform? 
pretty well, to be honest. Four megahertz and four million operations per second. It's not bad on a bed of wires and breadboards. Um, and a fellow called Matt Heffernan. So, yeah, so knowing the speed of the CPU is four megahertz doesn't really tell me a lot, it doesn't tell you a lot. Um, you, you really need to compare um, uh, what, uh, what this, this sort of thing with other people's work. Now, a fellow called Matt Heffernan has done a bunch of ben benchmarks on the internet um, for classic hardware, classic uh, machines. Um, he started um, looking at the, the performance of the basic programming language by plotting uh, Mandelbrot plots and then he moved on to um, putting those, that, those, those same programs into assembler on the various CPUs, Z80 and the 6502 within various computers. And James Sharman, he's also someone to look at up there on the internet. He's got his own retro CPU and he's making pretty bold claims. Um, is this the fastest 8-bit CPU ever? I know it's a bit tongue in cheek, but anyway, how does um, Spam1 stack up against these, these efforts? Well. Not bad at all. Span one knocks the pants off these other CPUs, and I wondered why Span one would perform well, relatively well, compared to these older and um, and new CPUs. Well, I think it comes down to two things mostly. Harvard, as an architecture, is really efficient. The um, program loading cycle um, can be done. The pro program instruction decoding and and load can be done in a single half cycle. So Harvard's really efficient. And also, I think another key thing is that. The ALU that I've got here, which is based on Warren Toomey's um, CSC Von 8 CPU, is really capable. It's got an 8-bit multiply operation in there, which and I'm using an 8-bit operation. We can build up 16 and 32-bit ops if that's what we want to do. So I think that's quite an interesting observation on the relative benefits of, um, say, a decent ALU versus something more complex like pipelining. Um, like I say, Matt Heffernan, his tests use the Mandelbrot. So let's take a look at Spam1's simulator pumping its Mandelbrot onto the serial terminal. Here we go, the program kicking off, loading the ROMs. And that is the same output you would see on the terminal if I was to hook it up to the Spam1 hardware. Now, down the bottom left, um, if you can see, um, it says it took 1.6 million instructions. So given that Spam1 runs at 4 megahertz, then the real hardware would do this in what, a quarter of a second or something like that? Um, so that's pretty good. That compares really well to those other efforts out there on the internet. So I did this project largely for nostalgia and for learning. What did I learn? Well, I, I learned that um, uh, a CPU built in software isn't, isn't hard, but isn't that rewarding? And you don't learn that much. Well, I didn't think I'd learn enough from it. Even even a fairly complex CPU built in software with that constraint isn't that interesting. It might be time consuming to build, but I don't think it's particularly interesting. Um, I would say, though, if you're going to build something like this, that simulation is key for the hardware build. Learn something like Verilog and Icarus. Um, they're a bit tricky to start with, but once you get the hang of them, they're pretty cool. But there are also other really good tools out there like Logism Evolution that can be used to visually and by a bit of coding construct working animated models of complex computers. Um, I don't know how well um, Logism is in terms of its propagation delay modeling. Um, I know that that works really well in uh, a system of Verilog and Icarus, but uh, yeah, maybe that's good enough. I'm not sure. I, I haven't tried it. Um, Hardware is really interesting, but you need software tools, compiler, assembler, and so on. And the hardware architecture is fast and easy, but limiting. And really, to make any of this interesting at all, you really need to compare it to other, other people's stuff. And of course, um, I got my first job um, in software, actually, through knowing how to use a soldering iron. And so this was, you know, it was fun to get back to, back to using that in some of the spin-off projects I had to build to build Spam 1, like those 8-bit um, displays that you saw earlier. Those are actually a separate project in Hackaday and on GitHub. And there are also a couple of videos on my channel for those as well. And I also wondered, should I have done computer science at university instead of engineering? I don't know. Maybe I should. Um, and of course, you need more time. Um, and I did mention earlier on another thing that I learned, don't use lithium batteries for this kind of stuff until, until, until the uh, implementation is stable. I learned about logism. It's really, it's really good for learning about electronics and building simulated hardware. Um, this, this model on display here was actually a really early incarnation of Spam 1. And I didn't mention it earlier as part of the Spam 1 journey because um, what I built here was way too simple and way too primitive to be worth building. 
Um, I, 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 it helps me think about the, the problem, but it really doesn't form any part of Span 1's lineage as it is today. So, um, what next? Well, not Spam 2, not until I've finished Spam 1. Um, like I said, I, I started that C compiler. I'd like to finish that. I'd like to finish the NES controller integration. Um, one thing I really want to do is I want to um, get some VGA graphics on top of this thing. That would really drive me to needing my oscilloscope, I think. Um, do some updates on YouTube. Here's one. This video you're watching now is one of those. And what I found was there was a, a bit of a shortage of good documentation on things like the development tools for building something like this. So, um, yeah, what else? Oh, a bit embarrassed by my YouTube channel. Um, I, um, I told um, my, my team at work not to subscribe to it. Um, I, I don't really know why I'm doing it. Curiosity, maybe, a bit of a challenge. I, I certainly didn't go looking for subscribers or anything like that, quite the opposite. But the cat's out of the bag now, so um, consider subscribing or just watch the videos if you're interested. Go and have a look at the Hackaday project or send me some kind of note. Um, there's information on GitHub and Hackaday on the, um, the design of Spam 1. There are some, some side projects I created. There's the seven segment display modules. Again, YouTube, Hackaday, GitHub, a place to look. Um, what else have we got? Uh, right, yes. An NES controller interface. So the controllers that I bought for this project are, um, they have they use the I2C protocol. So I needed some way to interface those to an 8-bit bus. There's some um, information out there on that project. Um, oh yeah, this this the integrated circuit tester. This is the first thing I built. So I bought a ton of chips off um, AliExpress and um, found that a whole ton of them didn't work. Um, surprised by that, I then created this little project to learn a bit more about electronics, about software, microcontrollers and whatnot. And you can put chips into that um, ZIF socket there on the top left and it will um, identify them. Or if you tell it which chip it is, it will go off and run a bunch of tests and tell you, we're not, well, tell you whether or not it's good. So, um, yeah, done. OK, there we are. There's some links. I'll put some more in the description. Um, those, if you, if you were to go to any of those links, there you'd find yourself at the root of um, my work. Um, I hope that was interesting, and I hope um, it helps avoid tons of questions about what I've been doing for the last few years um, on this home project. Cheerio, bye.